Did you know that the kidneys excrete only 2% or about 16 milliequivalents of the potassium that is filtered? Now that's a far cry from the roughly 90 milliequivalents that the kidneys excrete every day. So how do the kidneys excrete an additional 74 milliequivalents? So let's get busy talking about fundamental concepts that are needed to fully understand potassium secretion. Now the first concept you need to know is that most of the potassium is secreted into the lumen along the collecting duct by principal cells. Now principal cells secrete potassium via potassium ion channels and potassium chloride co-transporters, which are located in the apical membrane. Now the second concept you need to know is that potassium secretion is passive and the main driving force is the electrochemical potential. Now let's divide the electrochemical potential into its two components. In other words, the chemical potential and the electrical potential. Now the potassium chemical potential or potassium concentration gradient favors the secretion of potassium into the lumen as well as the interstitial fluid. On the other hand, the electrical potential opposes potassium secretion, especially when it's more negative. Now the average intracellular electrical potential of a principal cell is about minus 70 millivolts, while the electrical potential of the interstitial fluid is zero. This means that the potential difference across the basolateral membrane is minus 70 millivolts, which is close to the potassium equilibrium potential of about minus 85 millivolts. Now the equilibrium potential represents the electrical potential where there is no net movement of potassium in or out of the cell. Now as the potential difference becomes less negative, it begins to favor the outward movement of potassium, which is what happens across the apical membrane. You see, the electrical potential of the luminal fluid within the collecting duct is minus 30 millivolts, not zero. This means the potential difference across the apical membrane is minus 40 millivolts which is significantly less negative than the minus 70 millivolt electrical potential across the basolateral membrane. Now this means that there is less of an opposing force for potassium secretion across the apical membrane compared to the basolateral membrane. So keep in mind that anything that makes the luminal potential more negative will decrease the potential difference across the apical membrane and favor potassium secretion. Now with these concepts in mind, the easiest way to think about what influences potassium secretion is to ask yourself, does that affect the pathway? In other words, the potassium channel or the potassium chloride co-transporter. Also, does it affect the chemical potential? In other words, the concentration of intracellular or luminal potassium. And finally, does it affect the electrical potential? In other words, does it make the luminal potential more negative? which would favor potassium secretion. All right, I think we're ready to review the factors that influence potassium secretion. Now to keep this simple, we'll focus on the major players that regulate potassium secretion, and they are luminal flow, luminal sodium concentration, and epithelial sodium channel or ENAC abundance and activity. Now let's start with luminal flow. Increased luminal flow stimulates potassium secretion. Can you guess how? Well, first, increased luminal flow keeps luminal potassium low. In other words, it affects the chemical potential. Second, it increases enac-dependent sodium reabsorption, which makes the luminal potential more negative. And it also stimulates the sodium-potassium ATPase, which further increases the intracellular sodium concentration and the potassium chemical potential. So what factors lead to increased luminal flow? Well, volume expansion, acidosis, and the administration of osmotic, loop, or thiazide diuretics. And if left unchecked, it could lead to hypokalemia. Now conversely, volume contraction leads to decreased luminal flow and thus decreases potassium secretion. All right, let's move on to luminal sodium. Now increased luminal sodium stimulates potassium secretion. Can you guess how? Well, increased luminal sodium increases ENAC-dependent reabsorption of sodium, which makes the luminal potential more negative, and this favors potassium secretion, and it increases the potassium chemical potential through the activation of the sodium-potassium ATPase. Now, we just mentioned that. So, what factors lead to increased luminal sodium? Well, again, volume expansion, 
and genetic defects in sodium transport like Barter's and Gittleman syndrome, which are characterized by mutations in the NKCC2 and NCC co-transporters, respectively. Also, the administration of osmotic, loop, or thiazide diuretics. Now, these conditions are known to cause hypokalemia, so be on the lookout for them. Now, let's finish up with ENAC activity. So, increased ENAC activity or abundance stimulates potassium secretion. The mechanisms are similar to that seen in increased luminal sodium. Can you guess what increases ENAC abundance or activity? Well, the major player is the steroid hormone called aldosterone. Now, aldosterone is known to increase ENAC activity and increase the number of ENAC expressed in the apical membrane, both of which lead to increased sodium reabsorption and potassium secretion, as we just mentioned. Also, Little syndrome, which is a genetic defect in ENAC, leads to increased ENAC abundance in the apical membrane. Now, whether it's hyperaldosteronism or Little syndrome, both lead to hypokalemia as well as hypernatremia. Conversely, decreases in ENAC activity will decrease potassium secretion and could result in hyperkalemia. So remember, the key to determining whether something positively or negatively influences potassium secretion lies in knowing whether it affects potassium conductance, the potassium chemical potential, and or the electrical potential. And one last hint, since sodium reabsorption along the collecting duct is so tightly coupled with potassium secretion, factors that influence sodium reabsorption should always be considered when thinking about potassium secretion, 